Hey, people. Um, I'm over at Scott K Hill's uh, channel. And yeah, the footage is coming up now uh, of the um, the meeting gathering that they they had at um, I think it was called Church of Glad Tidings or something or other. But um, yeah, You know, it's it's easy to placate, and it's easy to downplay, and it's easy to stand in the shadows and be quiet. And uh, that is not the people who stand here before me tonight. And that's not the kind of people that just introduced me. I'm very honored to be here with you. And uh, to be some tiny part of the magnificent things that you're considering and that you're doing and to be some tiny reprieve perhaps for what you all must be feeling um, to be here and to sleep in the shadow of that dam uh, to maybe be one of you here for a day or two uh, is a great honor to me at least uh for a bit, I got to share what, what you've been living with, and it means a lot to me. I can only imagine how difficult it's been on families and all of you here. This is a serious, serious thing that you're dealing with. Beyond that, if I may kind of run off track here for just a bit, I, like many of you, consider myself a patriot. I love this country also. I would die for it. How many men spilled their blood for that? How many boys never saw their mothers? And now we stand at a crossroad as a nation. And you stand at a crossroad, I think, as a state. Uh, I believe that that things have never quite been like this in recent history of our great republic. And before I get started, I'd, I'd like to ask you some questions so that, so that I can see what your feelings are. How many people in this room right now, with a show of hands, feel that they have been justly and fairly represented How many of you feel that your very life has been threatened by a government which is out of control? Your wealth, your welfare. How many of you feel you've been misled and lied to? The parallels standing in this church to a time in our nation's history in 1775, also in a church, when an insignificant man stood up from the third set of pews and made a statement that changed the history of the world. A man who was barely noted before he uttered those words I wish so deeply that I had such words for you. <clears throat> that man, of course, was Patrick Henry. And in a similar situation to the one that you're facing now, with the same grievances that I've heard responded to here tonight, what that man said was this, I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. I understand that level of frustration. And I also understand that level of commitment. 
and I think that most of the men and ladies in this room also do. It is us, the few who show up, always. It is incumbent on us for the actions that change the world. You know, you, you see these magnificent evolutions of policy and politics across the globe, and you look at them and you see them as this mass movement. And it's not. It's a couple of ladies who care very deeply. It's a couple of men who've had enough of being lied to, who've had enough of having their home and their family threatened by men who would mislead and would lie at a time when lies are not acceptable. Those are the kinds of people that have risen up time and again. The one out of a thousand, the one out of a million, who've changed the course of this world. And those are the people that sit in front of me tonight. I'm honored by you. I'm going to tell you two truths about Oroville Dam. I'm going to tell you my truth, and I'm going to tell you their truth. The two have no similarity. I, I hate to blow my own horn. Sometimes it's necessary. I don't understand anything about you ladies. I'm an infant when it comes to relationships and many other things, but I know everything a man can know about dams. I've crawled inside of them. I've dived them thousands of times. I've been under the ice within the conduit, within the central section of dams. I've seen ports blowing water through dams. I've stopped failures of dams, and I've failed to stop failures of dams. I've seen decimation of people's homes and property as a result of poorly maintained dams, and just as a result of kinetically storing that much energy. I think it is a universal truth that one takes on a level of responsibility that is equal to the liability that they produce by their actions. Do you not think that's true? So if you have a farm pond and you have a dam that's eight feet high, there are men who can fine you $1,000 a day and put you in jail for six months for every day that you were in non-compliance with the dam safety regulations in California. Imagine that. So four or five of us go together and we buy a little pond where we can fish, an area where we can hunt, and we don't maintain our dam we can be put in jail for it. And yet the very men, the very same men who would take our freedom away from us, from a dam that produces almost no liability, manage the tallest dam in the United States of America, 770 feet from the bottom of his plunge pole to the top of his crest. And look, Look at how they've managed it. This is a clip from CBS Evening News. I acted as CBS Evening News expert on dams. Uh, this was a dam in the Northeast where where I spoke about as it was about to fail. These dams have been in place, many of them well over 100 years, with very minimal if any maintenance. Engineer Scott Cahill fixes dams for a living. He figures to be busy for a long time. A 2006 study found the nation's dams are in disrepair and dangerous. The eventuality of all this, if we don't get a hold of it, is that we're going to see cascading failures of large dams and significant loss of life. 
Well, here we are. Here we are. But for the grace of God, you might not be here. But for one man that stepped in front of a group of others and said, enough, we're getting the people out of here, you might not be here. I am an imperfect man. I flatter myself to think perhaps I'm a bit like Jefferson. He was an imperfect man. We stumble through our lives and our imperfection, and now and then, perhaps, if we're lucky enough, we find a word or a string of words. Jefferson did. Adam sent him on his way to Monticello. He stood in that spindled, tall chair by that long window at his desk. And he made the statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What magnificent words those are. We are each different in our own way, every single one of us. And that is one of the great magnificence of humanity. Thank God it is so. We're, we're a little quirky. I know I am. I think my great friend Paul is and Chris. But still, if you may think to yourself, I am at the bottom of this grand hill, and I wonder if I can do the things that I wish to do, and I wonder if I can make this grand, insurmountable change when I am an imperfect man. I answer you thus. Every change that has ever been made on this great, grand earth of ours that built this country that we so love, was done by men just like us. Flawed men, imperfect men, just guys who were thrown into circumstances that were insurmountable, that were unacceptable, that drove them to do things that they would not normally do. Those men that signed the document that we're honoring, King George sent them a letter back in response. He explained to them if you go through with this, I'll bring you all back to England, and I'll hang you. And I think that would have been the lucky ones. They put it all, as, as Paul had said so, so validly, they put it all on the line, everything they had, everything they would ever be. Can you imagine what Thomas Jefferson's life would have been like? had this entirety of the evolution of the United States of America not taken place. The best thing that he could have hoped for was a noose. I've published articles, I've been a writer since I was 10 years old. 